Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Scudic Institute at Acadia National Park here on the Cirque campus. Um, it's delightful to have this many folks show up when um, we just had that blizzard that went through. And it actually, we, um, you all would be joining a group um, called the Northeast Migration Monitoring Network who ordinarily would be here um, having a conference or their annual meeting about um, songbird migration through the Gulf of Maine. But with uh, a key component of folks coming from Acadia University in Nova Scotia, they were unable to loose themselves. So the uh, conference was postponed until May, so you can look forward to coming back perhaps for that. Um, but we took the chance that the blizzard would, would go by, it would clear, and um, we'd be able to hold this thing. So we're just tickled pink that you all chose to come out tonight. So thank you very much for that. My name is Seth Benz. I'm the director of the Bird Ecology Lab here. And from time to time through the year, we the, the Bird Lab, or the Bird Ecology Program, brings um, who we think are great speakers um, from the wonderful world of birds. And tonight is no exception. I'm pleased to introduce my friend, and um, we had the good pleasure of working together at a place called Hog Island down in um, Midcoast, Maine. But Jeff Wells is a Bangor native, went to high school, graduated there, went off to Cornell, University in Ithaca, New York for his master's degree and stayed on for his PhD. These days, um, Jeff works out of Gardner, Maine, but spends a lot of time in a circumpolar shawl of coniferous forest that is just below the Arctic. So this wonderful belt of coniferous forest that stretches all around the planet it becomes really, really significant habitat for a lot of our birds. And tonight, Jeff is going to take us on a trip to the Boreal Forest in Canada and, and then talk some about how that links to the birds that come right here, right through the, the Scudic region and Acadia National Park. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Wells. Okay, let's see if this is working here. Sounds like it. Okay, good. Do I have, is it loud enough for folks? I'm just going to stick it in my pocket here. Well, thank you, Seth. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming out. It's uh, great to finally get up here to see this great institution. I've been hearing about it from Seth for a number of years, and um, uh, growing up, uh, my, my high school years in Bangor, we used to come down to the Scudic Peninsula, of course, birding a lot, and um, I was sort of uh, taken under the wing. It's the, the nice bird analogy of the uh, Audubon chapter up in, uh, up in Bangor, the Penobscot Valley Audubon, and uh, some of those folks were really important for me, and they loved coming down here, and uh, as did my family. Um, uh, but I don't get over it this way as much, and uh, it's just been exciting to hear about some of the changes that are happening here and, um, and the new facilities and research that's going on. It's uh, very exciting, so it's fun to be here. Um, let's see, whoops. Uh, I'll, I'll show you that. That's, a, that's a, a, com a completely unrelated, except for the fact that birds project that I did with my wife, a, a book on Maine's, called Maine's Favorite Birds. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that at all tonight. Um, now, being where we are located here uh, in, in eastern Maine, a lot, of, a lot of people who know birds think of um, boreal birds as being a bird like the spruce grouse here. And it is a boreal bird, a bird that inhabits boreal habitat, spruce forest, spruce fir forests in our region especially. Uh, the black-backed woodpecker, another specialty, boreal specialty that the birders call them, and people come from all over the rest of the United States to, 
to Maine um, to look for the boreal specialty birds. But sometimes when we think of boreal birds, we, we don't think about some of these other birds, birds like lesser yellow legs here, or, or lesser and greater yellow legs, or yellow rumped warblers, or, or black throated green warblers, or, or some of these familiar birds of our backyards in, uh, and seacoasts, you know, the surf scoter up there in the right, the familiar winter bird we have around here, or uh, magnolia warbler. Uh, Junko and, and Scott, bird, some of these birds that come through in really large numbers. But the boreal forest, of course, uh, extends much further from Maine. Maine is the, the boreal birds that are in Maine are just at their very, very southern extreme of their range, just the very tip of their range down here. And the area that it's, they occur in boreal habitat, um, the boreal forest region itself. Uh, generally the way it's described doesn't even include the boreal habitats in Maine, as you can see from this map. Although again, we do have boreal habitats here, but when you draw our ecoregion boundaries, it's not usually included. Uh, the boreal forest of North America, again, as Seth said, it, this is a, a region that extends around the globe, but the boreal forest region of North America extends from Alaska all the way across Canada to Newfoundland. Um, it's an area of about 1.5 billion acres, and it is one of the largest intact forest areas left on Earth. If you see a map sometime of the largest areas that have never been cut, where there's almost no human industrial footprint, the largest areas, we think sometimes of the Amazon, and the Amazon is one of those. Um, but the other ones are the, the, the other largest ones are the North American boreal forest and the Siberian boreal forest. Um, it, there's also some significant forest left in the Congo Basin of Africa and um, parts of um, New Guinea and, and Indonesia, but the largest ones are the boreal forest of, of North America and Siberia and the Amazon. And that accounts for the fact that we have so many birds that pass through on migration. It isn't just a place that has boreal chickadees and spruce grouse, but it's a place that has an incredible diversity and abundance of birds uh, of every type, waterfowl, warblers, thrushes, shorebirds, herons, terns, all, 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 all sorts of birds. We did some work a few years ago to try to estimate how important the North American boreal forest was to birds. and did some modeling, and we estimated that there were actually one to three billion birds, that's billion with a B, that nest in the boreal forest. Um, and in the fall, when the young are included, that means there's three to five billion that come spilling out across the U.S.-Canadian border as they head south. They are some of our most common and abundant birds that we see in migration in winter. There are almost 100 species that have 50% or more of their entire range just within that boreal forest region. Um, it includes 30% of the landbirds and shorebirds of North America and about 30% of, of waterfowl. And like I said, it's uh, a diverse group, um, 47 families, almost 400 species that occur at one point or another, 276 species that have more than 5% of their global breeding range within the boreal forest. Some of my colleagues that I work with at um, Ducks Unlimited and Ducks Unlimited Canada have just done some recent analysis to look at the contribution of the boreal forest to the entire continent's waterfowl population. And you can see the numbers are pretty astounding. People talk about the prairie potholes as the most important place for, uh, for ducks. but um, if you, if you look at uh, the, um, the uh, entirety of the U.S. and Canadian boreal region, um, the boreal is basically like a sort of a, a sister to the prairie potholes. Um, it's, sometimes we talk about it as sort of the, the, um, you know, the, the forgotten waterfowl area because it's, it's just about as important as the prairie potholes, as you can see here. Some of the birds occur in this 
region in astounding numbers. A bird like the yellow rumped warbler that we, again, we think of as, um, it is a bird that breeds in Maine, but its breeding range extends over that entire boreal range that I showed. And that means that the numbers are incredible. About 60 million yellow rumped warblers that nest in that region. And that means that, you know, in the fall when we see these flocks and flocks of yellow rumped warblers here, that's because there's still a place like the boreal forest that's, that's intact where these birds can breed, and it's sending them down to us. Of course, the yellow rumped warbler is also one of the first birds that we're going to be enjoying here if the weather ever turns in the spring, too. Another one of our favorite birds, it's in every backyard um, in, uh, through much of the winter now in many places. I had, I had one or two in my, in my yard and gardener all winter, um, but certainly in spring and fall migration, uh, a common bird. And I, I guess my numbers aren't here, but the numbers are uh, something like 100 million of those that are produced in the boreal forest, that nest in the boreal forest and come out into the United States uh, to spend the winter, which is why they're one of our familiar backyard birds, and it's thanks to the boreal. Even a bird like this, which you wouldn't think of as a boreal bird, has a huge part of its range in the boreal forest, the Blackburnian warbler. This, by the way, is a banded bird, it's handheld. It's, it's usually harder to see these because they love to be in the very top of a tall spruce most of the time where you can barely see a little bit of orange and you can barely hear their very high-pitched song. But over 50% of all Blackburnian warblers nest in that boreal region. Really important area to sustain this species. And then there are some species that have almost their entire breeding range just in that boreal region. They're all basically like boreal endemics, if you will. And some of them are, uh, or may be surprising to some people, um, you know, again, white-throated sparrow, we think of that as a quintessential Maine bird, and it is. It's one of, you know, the favorite birds. When, we, when I do uh, the Maine, my Maine's favorite bird talk, that's one of the ones that we always talk about, because even if people don't um, know what it is, they just know the old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody song. They know that as the, the characteristic summer sound that they grew up with, even if they don't know that it's the white-throated sparrow. But most of the white-throated sparrows of the world actually just start down here and go all the way up through that whole boreal region. That's where um, the biggest part of their population occurs. Birds like Cape May warbler, the same thing. Buffalhead, great gray owl, and the unusual tree-nesting Bonaparte's gull occurs almost exclusively in the boreal region. Tennessee warbler, despite its name, that's what I love about, about some of these, you know, the Cape May warbler, the Tennessee warbler, the Philadelphia vireo, but they're all birds that breed almost exclusively in northern Canada in the boreal forest. Um, it's a bird that uh, comes down into especially Central America to spend the winter where it um, often does a lot of uh, nectar feeding um, and is probably one of the important pollinators of some of these tropical forests in this area because of the abundance of Tennessee warblers. Ninety-seven percent of Tennessee warblers breed in the boreal forest, about 60 million. You can imagine when 60 million birds end, end up on their wintering range in Central America, um, what kind of a difference they may make in uh, in, in the ecological communities of that, of that region. One of my favorite birds is the Lincoln Sparrow. Again, a bird that breeds in, in, in northern and eastern Maine, but it's really just the tip of its, the very southern portion of its breeding range. Most of it extends over the, the rest of the boreal forest. Over 80% of Lincoln Sparrows nest in the boreal forest. And of course, a favorite of people who like to talk about migration, the black hole warbler, a bird that uh, in the fall takes off from the Maritimes in Maine, heads out over the ocean for a three or four, five day nonstop journey to catch the winds blowing across from the, from, from the Sahara, from Africa, to blow it into South America where it's going to spend the winter. And about 18 million 
black pole warblers nest in the boreal forest of North America. Sadly, it's a bird that's uh, seen some steep declines since, since 1980, and some of those declines um, we don't fully understand because much of its breeding range is still intact and much of its wintering range is still intact, it might be a bird that's actually being impacted by some of the um, phenological mismatches. Seth and I were talking about this earlier. Many of these long distance migrants um, don't have cues that being, being wintering, in, because of the fact that they winter in the tropics, they don't always have cues to know that they should leave earlier to come back. Birds that are short distance migrants, we've been finding on average are coming back about two weeks earlier than they used to um, over the last 50 years or so. Uh, some of the long distance migrants like the black pole warbler that winter in South America only are coming back a few days earlier and the question is whether they're arriving too late to get a nest started, get the young hatched and time it right so that the young are around when we have the peak of insect abundance that allows them to feed the young. There's some studies in Europe on some other species that have shown that some of these birds now there is a mismatch between the timing of their arrival and the timing of other parts of their life history. And this may be one that's um, affected by that. We don't really know. There could be other reasons why it's declining. The bay-breasted warbler is another beautiful boreal forest breeder that people love to, uh, to try to see. But there's a whole host of them. And it includes, interestingly, uh, a lot of a lot of aquatic birds. People often don't realize that the boreal forest has the largest area of surface freshwater of any area on Earth. There's literally millions and millions of lakes, and most of those lakes, or many of those lakes, are still virtually untouched. It has um, some of the largest lakes in the world, um, if, even if you don't include the Great Lakes, which are half in the boreal, if you will. Um, there's, there's lakes like um, Great Slave Lake and Great Bear Lake, two lakes that are within the top 10 largest lakes in the world. Great Bear Lake has a, only a single community of 600 people living on its shores. This is a lake the size of New Jersey with 600 people living on its shores. It's thought to be the most pristine in the world. The lake where you can pull out um, lake trout that are as big as your leg, you know, some of the largest in the world, um, fish that are probably 60, 70, 80 plus years old. Um, some really amazing places, and of course, because of that, there's a lot of interesting water birds, loons and, and grebes, even pelicans. One of the largest, um, uh, most dense concentrations of, of cormorants even, believe it or not, is in a lake in the boreal forest in Manitoba. So really important for a range of birds that goes way beyond what people think of as the boreal birds, the boreal specialties. It's not just boreal chickadees and spruce grouse and blackback woodpeckers, but it's a whole huge diversity of birds, and it's the birds that we think of as those that are most familiar to us here in winter and during migration. The boreal forest um, is, again, uh, part of this huge global forest that has changed dramatically over the thousands of years. Um, this is a recreation of where we think the large forests were um, 8,000 years ago, and where the areas, the forests that have never been cut are today. And this again shows you that graphically um, how, especially those three largest areas, the Siberian boreal Amazon and, and um, boreal forest of North America, how important they are. We figure that about 25% of the world's so-called frontier forests or untouched intact forests are within the boreal forest of North America. And if you just look at boreal forests, about half or over half of the intact boreal forests are in North America. Much of the Siberian boreal forest is a bit more fragmented and a lot of uh, issues over there with um, illegal logging and, and, and other problems. Probably not a surprise given what's going on with Russia today that they have some issues with governance and, um, and illegal things in Russia related to forestry as well. So, The reason that the boreal has such a diversity of birds is that it is not a uniform carpet of just of green like a, like a 
Christmas tree plantation. That's how a lot of people think of the boreal forest, but it's really an, an incredible area of diverse habitats, you know, with areas that have uh, uh, cliffs and, and, and mountains. Uh, and, well, actually, let me, before I jump to this next slide, uh, it's an area that has, um, as I said, you know, literally millions, millions and millions of lakes and ponds. Um, it has perhaps the world's largest wetland, the, uh, the James Bay, um, Hudson Bay Wetland Complex, which spans all the way from Manitoba across all of uh, on, uh, northern Ontario to Quebec, just a massive area. Um, it's, it's certainly the largest peatland system in the, in the entire world and maybe the largest wetland complex in the world. It has just an amazing diversity of, of habitats and, and because of that, an amazing diversity of birds. We are fortunate, though, that 80% of the boreal is still intact and that is really something that um, gives um, a, a real opportunity for trying to get it right this time. Um, because it's so intact, it is also one of the last places on Earth that have, still have healthy populations of things like uh, caribou, a, a, an animal that we had in Maine even, of course, until about 1912 or so when the last one was shot on, on Katahdin, in which people have tried to reintroduce to Maine several times unsuccessfully now. Um, and sadly, um, that, that particular type of caribou, the woodland caribou, is, is actually gone from half of its range, uh, even in Canada, and it's now um, uh, on the threatened list in Canada, and there's incredible work trying to protect the last um, remaining woodland caribou. It also has some of the last, and the lar world's largest herds of migratory caribou, the ones that inhabit the tundra and that we sort of think of as the ones we've seen on TV that make these massive migrations and have sometimes hundreds of thousands or a million in a herd. Um, and because the boreal is still intact, these are one of the last large scale, large mammal migrations on Earth. Again, we kind of all grew up watching, you know, the, the specials on, on TV about the, the great herds on the African plains, you know, that do these great migrations hundreds or thousands of miles. But many of those mi migrations have now been stopped by, you know, agriculture or fencing and different things. So some of the last great migrations of mammals that are left are still in this boreal forest, these herds that'll travel thousands of miles in a big circle from the uh, calving areas in the summer down into the boreal forest regions where they spend the winter to feed and then back again. Of course, um, you know, wolves, another thing that we, another species we had in Maine um, at one time and May one day again, we'll see. Um, but there's still healthy populations of wolves, some of the largest populations of wolves. Grizzly bears, again, a species that has lost ha half or more of its range. And there's still many uh, great strongholds for, for grizzly bears uh, in the western part of the boreal forest. I mentioned the importance of the boreal for fresh water. Again, it has not only some of the world's largest lakes, it has some of the last undammed river, rivers in North America. Um, there's virtually any um, large river in the United States has been dammed. As, I think there's one, uh, the Pascagoula River in, I think, Mississippi that has a 300-mile stretch that's not dammed, but that's the, pretty much the only long stretch of a larger river that's undammed within the U.S. There's still rivers in, in, in the boreal region that are you know, free flowing from mouth to, to headland. And, and they are also the last places where there are um, healthy Atlantic salmon populations that are still moving and migrating up and down those rivers, the ones we're trying to bring back in our rivers, you know, that we're spending, what is it, 50 million or so on the Penobscot River to try to save those, that last bit of Atlantic salmon that are coming in and try to bring some of the spawning fish back. There's rivers there that are still undammed, free flowing, and the fish are moving back and forth through them. Unfortunately, there's also a major push to try to put more dams up on these wild flowing rivers in places like Quebec and Manitoba and some other places. The ones in Quebec, of course, are to send so-called clean energy down to us so we can have the clean energy and not think about where our energy comes from. 
Uh, it always seems ironic to me that we're willing to dam a river in Quebec while we spend 50 million to take the dams out of our rivers in Maine. So I, um, you know, the, some of the ways we look at that is that if you are going to dam a river, then you also need to make sure you're also protecting some of the rivers from, from headwater to mouth so that you still retain some rivers where the fish can, can move. Or if you're going to put dams in, you put them in rivers that are already impacted and leave other ones open. So there are some, some solutions that you can balance both of those things. But, um, but anyway, many of the, the largest uh, in, uh, uh, rivers and, and wetlands in the world. Uh, should I should throw in the Mackenzie River in there. That's the a river that's like the Mississippi River. But if you can imagine the Mississippi River, the entire Mississippi River without a dam on it. There are some dams way, way, way at you know a thousand miles in on the Mackenzie River, but you know something like a thousand miles of of river without a dam on it. A river the size of the Mississippi. Uh, that there's still a river like that in. In, in the boreal forest of Canada. These massive wetlands and peatlands hold immense stores of, of carbon. And in today's age, when we're talking about carbon sequestration and global warming, it's particularly important to know that this is um, one of the largest storehouses of carbon on the Earth. We like to call it the Fort Knox of carbon. Um, there's more carbon per, per acre in boreal forest and then in, even in tropical forest because once the carbon goes into the plants and the soil, it's held there a long time because it's really cold. So decomposition is very slow. So you can have areas where peatlands, for example, can be 15, 20 feet or more deep and you can have um, organic matter that's held under permafrost from 5,000 years ago. So. Um, much of this carbon is very ancient, and it's a huge carbon storehouse. Brings keeps sucking up carbon. It's really important for maintaining that um, that uh, kind of a climate buffer. Now, any area, pretty much on Earth, that is sort of still seen as a, a frontier of of um, intactness of wilderness is is usually also seen as a frontier for natural resource expansion uh, and use, and, if, and that's true in the boreal. It's, there's a clamor going on with uh, forestry, mining, oil and gas, and, and hydro uh, and, uh, to, to use all the natural resources. It's seen as you know, the, the place where um, there's huge opportunities to make a lot of money and to get a lot of resources out of the ground for all sorts of things, and it's, it's happening quickly. The decisions are being made now. Already, uh, much of the southern boreal forest has been leased to um, companies for, for, for forestry. Uh, the, the, the way you approach conservation here is a little bit different than we're used to in, in the US, or the eastern US at least. Virtually the entire boreal forest region is all government-owned land, so-called crown land um, in Canada. So it's not a matter of going out and buying a piece of land um, and saving it that way. It's a matter of working with the government, wh whether it's the provincial government or the federal government or a First Nation government, in deciding how that land is going to be used. Um, and so the challenge for people working in conservation, like uh, the group that I work for, is you know, how do you, how do you um, get in ahead of before decisions are made and try to make the decisions in a balanced way. Forestry um, was something that's been around for decades. And um, the red in this map are the areas that have already been leased to um, forestry companies. Some of the leases are you know, twice the size of the state of Maine. These are very large leases, and many of the companies are from other parts of the world, in multinational uh, timber interests. But um, the, uh, the good news around, around the forestry issue is that um, with some of the struggles of the forestry industry that we've seen in, in, here in Maine as well, there have been many uh, mill closures and issues related to kind of the global economy and globalization of paper that have kind of brought the 
uh, timber industry, the paper industry, together with environmentalists, and a new pact has been developed um, with all the leading forestry companies in Canada to figure out a way to, to do a more balanced approach. And um, there's actually been several uh, major announcements and some, some ones that we expect over the next year for kind of withdrawals of some of this land to turn it into conservation land, uh, take it back from being leased into conservation land and sort of balancing um, the areas that are used for forestry with, with conservation. So some really good news there around that. There are also large deposits of, of oil and, um, and tar sands, many of you have heard about, in places like Alberta. Uh, and some major activities there that are affecting lots of the boreal forests, and you've probably heard lots about that as discussions happen with about bringing the oil uh, to places like like Maine to have it shipped to to refineries. Um, that's that's one of many kinds of industrial uses of the landscape that are happening. Mining is another one I didn't mention, but um, there are actually diamond mines in. Uh, very large open pit diamond mines in, in many parts of the northern boreal and in, in uh, Ontario and in Northwest Territories. You don't think of diamond mining in a place like that, but uh, that's one of the types of mining, nickel mining, uh, lots of different kinds of mining, and it's one of the biggest challenges that will impact the boreal in the future, and we're still working on that. I threw this in here partly because there's the passenger pigeon out in the lobby. Um, but I, this is a, a slide that kind of always tries to, reminds me that it's, it's easy, I think, sometimes for us uh, in this today's day and age, sort of our, we think of ourselves as enlightened around conservation. And we look at the, the passenger pigeon mounted up, up there, think about that, or, or the Eskimo curlew here in the, the right side. Uh, I was telling Seth, I think the last n known one from from Maine was, was shot at Squidic Point in the 1920s. Um, la the last documented one was shot in Barbados in 1963 or 64. Two birds that are, are gone from our landscape and we look back at um, what happened to those birds and, and other birds that have disappeared and we always sort of think, well, those guys, they were, you know, so, so, uh, crazy and, and stupid, they didn't realize what was going on. They didn't think about it. But I, I think, you know, are, are we really that different sometimes when I think about, you know, uh, one of the analogies I use is if you're looking out your backyard window at your feeder and you see some white-throated sparrows out there and then you turn to the counter to wipe up a spill and you rip off a paper towel to wipe it up and that paper towel is from, you know, boreal, virgin boreal forest that was cut to give you a paper towel and you know so you're you're looking at that and thinking how much you enjoy that bird resource while you're wiping your counter up with a resource that just came from from where that bird came from and and you know we don't think about our choices if we if we're getting hydropower cheaper from Quebec um, and it's going to affect those buffalo heads that you enjoy uh, all winter you know, do we make that connection? Are we really that different? Hopefully we are and we'll, we'll try to do something different. Our organization is uh, called the Boreal Songbird Initiative. It's a US-based organization that works with Canadian partners to try to educate Americans about the importance of the boreal forest to birds. And we have um, a number of uh, partners that we work with that also work directly with government and with businesses and industry in Canada to try to uh, find solutions and positive ways to protect the boreal forest. Our main goal is actually as a whole uh, coalition is to try to protect half of that 1.5 billion acres. So we're trying to protect over 500 billion acres of boreal forest. It's one of the largest conservation initiatives in the world, uh, sort of akin to when Teddy Roosevelt was trying to protect the, the uh, American West with his big, big conservation um,
pronouncements in the early part of this century. It's, 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 in, it's on the order of those sorts of sizes. And we have a website uh, that has a lot of information about what's happening in the boreal and about boreal birds if you want to uh, check into that. There's been some great news. We have seen some of the largest conservation accomplishments um, in, in the world in the last uh, decade or so. This is a confusing map, but these, these red areas basically are, are some of the most recent protected areas. And we've had protected areas, um, some of them that are um, you know, millions of acres, some of these areas and the Northwest Territories are, you know, the size of the state of Maine collectively. Very big, tens of millions of acres. Um, some of the ones in Quebec and, and, and Labrador to our north are, you know, one, two, three million acre size protected areas. So very, very large areas. Um, very large areas, again, tens of millions of acres that are now in uh, FSC forest certified lands and under good forest stewardship. And then we had the premiers of both Ontario and Quebec pledge to protect half. They basically uh, agreed to protect half of their boreal forests, a, a commitment that um, is in the you know, hundreds of millions of acres. Those are commitments that still are in the process of being turned into action because um, you can imagine the policy of, of making that happen isn't, doesn't happen overnight. But in Ontario, we actually have a bill that was passed that you know, states right in the bill, right in the legislation, that they will protect half of their northern boreal forest. And they're trying to find um, all the intricate ways to carry out land use planning to get that done. Um, but some really big conservation gains. And we're very hopeful that we actually will see the protection of 500 plus million acres across that boreal forest. And still have white-throated sparrows and buffleheads in our backyards and, and bays forever. Well, because um, this talk was kind of connected originally to a migration-themed conference, the, the, the conference may not have happened, but I, I basically tried to make this the second part of my talk to talk a bit more about migration. And one of the aspects of migration that, that I love in particular and have um, really delved into and, and studied a bit is um, is nocturnal migration. Now, as I said, about three to five billion birds leave the boreal forest in the fall and spill down into the US, Mexico, all the way down into, well into South America. And if you do the back of the envelope calculations, you'll find that that means about 30 to 50 million birds a night on average pass over the US-Mexican border between August and November. And a huge number of those come over Maine because actually they don't just go over the border equally. They tend to go to the east and then go over the border. So those birds from Alaska and to the west tend to go eastward and then south. And so we have some nights in the fall, probably millions of birds going over us in Maine. And you think to yourself, okay, 30 to 50 million birds a night. Uh, I, don't, you know, I don't remember seeing anything like that you know, when I was out birding. How, how come I'm not seeing that? Well, along with the fact that there's a lot of birds over, uh, spread out over a large area, the fact is most of these birds actually migrate at night. Most people don't realize that it's kind of the exception rather than the rule to migrate during the day. There's relatively few birds that migrate during the day. Hawks migrate during the day, and ducks will migrate during the day, but they also migrate at night. They go day and night. Some of the blackbirds migrate during the day, but most birds, the bulk of them actually all migrate at night. And so, you know, while you're sleeping, that's when those millions of birds are going over. And of course, I'm not going to go into all the really fascinating aspects of how they find their way in navigation. Some really uh, cool research uh, has been done to show that they use stars, and some of them can use low frequency sounds, and uh, some of them can use polarized light lots of different ways, um, but, but they do migrate at night, and, they, uh, and lots of them do this. One of the greatest stories of migration is, again, the black pole warbler, a bird that uh, migrates at night largely. 
Um, it moves, again, from the boreal forest to South America. It doesn't go in a straight line like that green arrow shows, though it heads off from the Maine and the Maritimes towards heading towards Africa. And you can imagine um, these, these little birds, especially in their first year, they don't travel with their, their parents. They are on their own. Some bird was born up in, let's say, Alberta. For some reason, it's something in its head that moves it over towards, towards Maine, and it just keeps going. And then some night, something else in its head just tells it, fly out in the dark, out over this trackless ocean, some direction you don't know where you're going, you've never been, you're all by yourself, and just start flying. And you're heading, they don't know it, but they're heading towards Africa. Uh, in a way, the worst way, place you could go if you didn't know what you were doing. And they're going to have to fly three, four, five days, day and night. There's no stopping. There's no place to stop. A little teeny bird the size of your fist. No place to get a drink, nothing to eat. They just keep on flying and keep on flying. Uh, and somehow, you know, they, as they get down off of South America or, or the Eastern Caribbean, the trade winds that are coming across there blow them in to South America where they land. Sometimes that's also the period when we get hurricanes sometimes, and occasionally they'll get caught up in hurricanes and you'll have massive uh, dropouts of fallouts of these birds on some of those Caribbean islands in the, the Lesser Antilles, uh, where there'll be thousands of black pole warblers all hopping around trying to find some food uh, before they resume their journey. Just amazing migration. Cape May Warbler does it a little bit differently. Uh, again, out of the boreal forest, but they just drop down into the greater Antilles, becoming one of the most common winter birds that you see in places like Cuba and in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, in every garden, in every habitat. And um, often you actually see them with little bits of uh, pollen on their faces. They're, they really love to feed on nectar. And again, another one of these ones that may be s critically important in pollinating things in these tropical forests, but we really don't know the whole story there. On migration, of course, birds have to contend with, with weather, and they don't get to get on their iPhones and look at the uh, weather patterns. They just have to uh, sort of figure it out as they go. Um, in the spring, they are looking for highways of wind that are going to help them get where they're, where they're going to go. They're looking for, for winds blowing up from um, in, in going south to north. I mean, you can imagine uh, that Cape May warbler you know, coming up from, from Cuba, say, and if the wind's blowing uh, towards, the, towards the east, that's not going to be very favorable for getting where it wants to go. It's going to be blowing it off course and making it harder. If it's blowing from the south, it's going to make it much more easy to go. And so you know, a lot of the bird migration is, is timed around uh, taking advantage of, of these winds. If something's coming up from Central, Central America or Mexico, um, taking advantage of, of a... Uh, wind blowing from south to north makes sense for the Canada warbler, for example, which is winters in northern South America and comes up along Central America. It's not a, a trans-gulf migrant usually. It doesn't cross um, the ocean in appreciable numbers. So migration, and sometimes we show these migration maps that, um, and we talk about flyways, and it almost seems like, oh, the birds have this Atlantic flyway, and they all fly in this one place, and they go up that sort of, you know, like it's, like it's uh, the turnpike. It's I-95, and they all are going to go on that one, and this one goes on this highway. But the truth is the, the highway shifts its location every night, every time. They're basically taking advantage of these shifting rivers um, of, of wind, and they become what I like to call... Uh, a, a bird current in, the, in migration. I sort of think of it as the great bird current, and the current of birds is going to shift and change depending on where they hit different favorable winds and how they move. Trying to see this nocturnal migration is obviously difficult because it happens at night. Um, there are some ways you can experience it and, and see it and, and enjoy it, and it is really something that's very exciting to see because, again, if you think of it this, that you know, while you're sleeping or, or watching TV, you know, there's millions of birds going over. It's kind of an astounding thing. I, I remember coming out of a movie uh, with my son, uh, watching one of those, that one about the penguins in Antarctica, and the penguin march, I think it was called, and 
you know, we went to the movies and saw this great wildlife spectacle about these birds migrating and all this, you know, and, and it was a great movie. Um, but we came out into the parking lot afterwards and I, and I just thought how, you know, it's so typically American kind of, you know, we, we go into a movie theater or watch TV to see a far away thing of this great spectacle. And while we came out of the movie theater, there were hundreds of Swainson's thrushes calling in night migration. One of the greatest wildlife spectacles on earth was going on over our heads right here in Maine. And like, you know, we were the only ones who knew it. All these other people were, you know, they thought about, well, you have to go to a, a movie or Antarctica to see that, or Africa or some faraway place. It happens right over our heads every night. One way that people um, study this and enjoy it is, is actually looking at the moon, especially with, you know, if you look at the moon with binoculars or a telescope on a really good migration night, you will actually see birds flying across the face of the moon. And it is, it is uh, pretty cool to see. You don't see, you know, a, a huge number of birds, and they tend to be sort of very small and, and quick. I have likened it sometimes to trying to follow a baseball game by watching first base by looking through a straw. You know, you're just seeing a tiny piece of the action. But it is, it is cool to see, and it gives you something visual. Another way you can experience it is by looking at at radar, and the weather radars that we have in the U.S. in particular, it's not true uh, through much of the world, but the ones in the U.S. Um, are able to pick up bird migration. And you can now get online at any time and actually sort of see migration happening. And there's a few things you can learn about how to tell if it's the difference between rain, in this case, with these sort of blocky blobs, um, and birds that are exploding. And one of the ways is if you look on the radar and it tells you it's, there's no rain around, it's in clear air mode, and and there's no precipitation, and yet you see this cloud of something. That usually means birds. And you know, again, you can get on after dark and suddenly see this cloud of thousands of birds taking off in migration from around where the radar is, is located. And there's actually some maps you can see online now where it shows like all of the radars in real time across the entire United States. So you can see this migration happening across the whole US. It's pretty exciting. This is a. Uh, this is one right after dark showing this cloud of birds leaving from uh, New Jersey. Some of, some of the, one, the, the far off pieces are, are, are rain or clouds, but that exploding cloud are thousands of birds taking off in night migration. Another way you can experience migration is actually by, by listening. Um, and that's the easiest way and one of the favorite ways I have is you can go outside and just stand there and you can actually hear the sounds of birds flying over. Um, and it, you know, I think a lot of people probably sort of peripherally have heard sounds like this, but just think, oh, it must be a cricket or, or something, or I mis misheard it. Um, but if you go out and tune in on a really big night, especially in the spring, the birds occasionally will even break into full song over your head. Really amazing to hear a common yellowthroat just suddenly break out, witchety, 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 singing over your head, or a scarlet tanager breaking off into song over your head. At other times, they're just giving little, little short notes, um, and I'll play some of those in a minute. Some of them are very easy to recognize, like the Swainson's thrush I mentioned sounds just like a spring peeper. So if you hear a spring peeper up in the sky, you know it's probably not a spring peeper unless it's raining frogs, which they say has happened, but um, you know it, it's probably this bird migrating. And the night when you hear hundreds of them going over, it's really exciting. I have a set up with a very simple sort of homemade, it's called a pressure zone microphone. These can be made for um, under $100, probably $50. Um, very simple setup. And there's some um, directions on how to do these on, online even. That's what the microphone, a, a cheap version of it looks like. You can set them up on your roof and you can run a line into your computer. And again, with some free software, you can um, have what's called automatic detection software. And any sound that comes in that's within the range of the frequency and length of a bird call, it saves it as a file with the date and time. And so rather than staying up all night and listening, which is hard to do over and over many nights, you can stay up for a while. But if you want to hear what's going over the whole night, you set one of these up and you let it run. And then in the morning, you can get up and you can listen to them. And you can look at the sonograms, the sort of sound graphs of the different bird calls and see what, what went over. And so I usually run one of these, mainly uh, originally just for fun at my house in Gardner. And 
For example, some years ago, these were some of the sounds I heard, and these were um, sounds that you, many of you will recognize because these are the same calls that they give during the day for these birds, like the Canada goose that went over at 3 a.m. a little bit. Just gives that, you know, a normal kind of honking call. Uh, the killdeer, a lot of you know the sound of the killdeer. This is one that went over at 3 a.m. over my house. So some of the sounds that they give are the same sounds you hear during the day. Some of them are, again, sounds you might hear during the day, though you might not know as well. And they might be birds that you don't see as well. I live right in, in town. There's no marsh nearby. And yet, 10.30 uh, PM, I had this American bittern fly over. It's a little bit like a short uh, great blue heron call, sort of. I love these ones here. Um, again, I don't live anywhere near any wetlands. You know, I live in a sort of a suburban neighborhood. Um, and yet, I get these birds over my house regularly. Virginia rail, a chicken-like marsh bird that, you know, people may go years without seeing or hearing unless you really go out with tape recordings and really look for them. And I can get dozens of them going over my house. This is one that went over 9.30 p.m. in, in uh, late April a few years ago. Now, of course, some of these are esoteric sounds that not everybody would know, but um, once you start kind of keying into them, it's kind of exciting to know um, some of the birds that are going over. Now, this is a one that anybody can identify. If you just, again, if you hear a spring peeper over your head, and I can guarantee you that if you go out in late May, sometimes even into early June, out here on a, on a nice, uh, relatively calm night, you will hear Swainson's thrushes going over. Um, even more interesting for many people is gray cheek thrushes. It's a bird that you might go years without finding one on the ground. Um, they're hard to find in migration. But you can go out and hear 50 or 100 of them go over your house some nights in, in spring migration and in fall migration. A little bit like the. Uh, Swainson's thrush, but that kind of has a more weird sound. It goes up and down. Even if you don't know what some of these calls are, just hearing them all raining down from the sky is really a cool experience. This is one of the uh, easy ones to recognize if you hear it. I haven't heard uh, these in Maine much. The black-billed cuckoo, a very distinctive call. And then you get into some calls that are a bit more esoteric um, of some of our more familiar birds. But again, I'll just play them quickly. But again, birds, you might be indigo bunding. You might not see a lot of those, but you can hear hundreds of them going over at night. And even if you don't know what any of them are, just standing there and listening to this chorus of sounds raining down on a spring night in particular, like. Um, you know, after it's been rainy for a few nights and the birds are just waiting to get back, suddenly the, the winds turn from the south and you go out and you just hear thousands of birds flying over all night long like that. And some of them breaking into song. Just amazing uh, sounds. These are some of the variety of sounds. Very short. Those are the ones that people think of as insects. Hard to tell apart, but if you're really looking for a challenge in your birding, this is a, a fun way to go. I won't go into all of these ones, but you start getting into more and more esoteric challenges for the birders who really like to push the limits. It is possible to identify many of the different warblers just by their, by their calls. And it is kind of cool when you, when you start even just recognizing one or two of them. It's, it's fun. So I'm going to end there, but um, again, uh, I hope that all of you, when, when the birds start arriving back in spring migration in, in numbers, if you'll think not only about getting out and enjoying this incredible wildlife spectacle, one of the greatest wildlife spectacles on Earth, right over our heads every night while we're sleeping, but also think about where these birds are, are going to. That boreal forest kind of way off in the distance north of us that we never think of is one of the last large wilderness areas left on the entire planet 
uh, easy, easy to forget. Um, even for people that have been up in some of the boreal forest, you know, I remember one of the trips I took to the Northwest Territories when I was uh, flying, and I had been in this plane flying from Yellowknife to a t the town of Delaney on Great Bear Lake, the 600-person community, and we've been going about an hour in this plane, and it suddenly occurred to me that I had never not seen any sign of of humans on the ground from that plane for, for an hour, and we had an hour, another half hour to go. And I thought to myself, wait a second, there is no single place in the entire continental US where you can even, I mean, if you're in a plane, there's no place where you won't, won't see signs of humans around you. I mean, even places we think of as great wilderness areas in the west, there's none of them that are more than, you know, there's a couple of places that are about 20 miles from a road, so it's sort of little sections. But there's no place where you could ever even get in a plane and not see a sign of humans. And I had been going for an hour without any signs of humans. And there's only a few places left on the entire Earth where that could be done. One of them is just to our north. Um, and we have a huge impact on what happens there based on our consumer connections, the things we buy and, and our choices. So um, look, look for ways that you can be involved in helping make positive decisions to to make sure we get that protected as, as we're working on it. And thank you for your attention. So um, we have time for some questions, if anyone has any. And uh, all we ask is that Abe or myself will come around with a microphone so that we can record your question. Does anybody have any questions? In the, in the early part of your talk, you had a, a bird up there which looked fascinating, but it, it was black and it had a red beak like, but the top of its head looks like a big top. And oh, the very first one? It was early in your talk. The spruce grouse? Perhaps it was the spruce grouse. I'll see if I can go right back to that and see if that is the spruce grouse. Not this guy? That one? No? This guy? What's that? The surf scoter. Uh, he has a white eye that's underneath the white forehead. Yeah, way up there, yeah. Yeah, very, uh, the scoters have these just wildly odd beaks, very bright colored, and there's, you know, black scoters, surf scoters, and white wing scoters. All three scoters breed virtually or, or really entirely in the boreal forest region. I mean, they come down and there are, are sort of relatively common winter ducks that we get to see all, all winter here, um, but they're exclusively a boreal breeder. We, we owe their, the fact that they're here to the fact that there's still this pristine uh, boreal forest and boreal wetlands up there. There's some really cool uh, um, satellite, speaking of migration, some work that's gone on in places like on the Atlantic coast of Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay where they put satellite uh, transmitters on these birds and tracked where they're going to. And some of the birds from uh, Ch Chesapeake Bay and, and, and Delaware Bay actually go all the way across up into the Northwest Territories or even further into Alaska to, to Nask, northern Manitoba, places like that. Some of them do go up just straight north up into like Quebec, but a lot of them are going way across up into um, the western part of the boreal forest. Really interesting work. Any other questions or comments? Well, a couple of things. Did this work? Um, why, is, why is the migration at night, do you think? Or is there any theories on that? Is it to avoid predation? Is it what? Yeah, the, the theories, uh, um, there are a few. And one of them is, is to avoid predation. Of course, you know, um, anybody who's watched Migration, fall migration in a place like, like this has seen you know, you know, the, the merlins and the peregrine falcons and the sharp shinned hawks chasing after the, the flickers and the yellow rumped warblers. You know, they basically follow their, their food supply with them. They travel with it and they, and they eat the birds as they go. Um, so go, at night, there's basically no, no predators that you would have to deal with. At night, you also tend to have 
uh, more stable atmosphere. So, um, you, know, you know, you don't have thermals and things like that affecting you as much. Um, it's cooler, so it's, it's, a, it's a physiologically demanding process to, you know, to fly all night. And so you lose, uh, it's, it's cooler, so you get less overheated, you lose less water, things like that. Um, and also, you know, you, when you do have a, a, a starry night, they have more accurate migration. They can, they can use other clues, but they tend to be less, less precise about, about their migratory heading with other um, cues except for um, using the stars or the North Star in particular. So probably all of those things are, are true. Um, well, are one, of, one of the things I think I've learned tonight is um, like offshore in the fall, we, we often see small birds like the, the warblers, especially some of the yellow, I, I can't identify all of them, but, and they often land on your boat. Yeah. So I always thought that um, they were just birds just blown, blown offshore by some wind or something like that, and, and uh, this, you know, of course, would be in the daytime that they'd land on your boat, and often they'll stay there quite a while, and I've often brought some of them back to land thinking yeah. that that was a thing to do, but obviously they were on their way somewhere else. But they, they're in great danger of uh, the gulls. The gulls love to eat little birds. And so yeah, no, they do. And they, uh, you know, a lot of, if you're on the coast or on an island um, in the um, early morning, you know, you'll see birds descending from, they've been flying all night, and they want to they come down to land. So um, although black pole warblers and a few other birds are known to do these long over water flights, there's not, other bird, not that many other ones that are at least known to regularly do it. Some of them may do it and we don't know, but we do know that a lot of them you know, will, when it comes uh, you know, light and they find themselves out over the water, they, you know, probably they don't always realize where they are um, and they see an island, they tend to glom onto it, which is why a place like Monhegan Island is famous for bird watching, because you go out there and there are thousands of birds all over the place, sometimes, you know, rare, a lot of rare birds and things like that, because the island is basically sort of like, you know, a magnet that's pulled in all those birds that, that at first light discovered they were out over the ocean and really didn't want to be there, and they, that's the closest place they can see, so you sort of sampled, it's like you sampled like a fishnet that sampled a huge piece of the migration uh, current, if you will, and sucked it down onto that one little island. So it's a lot easier to see the birds and to see the oddities sprinkled out, whereas if that same piece of birds had been over land, they just would have come down and been all diffuse, and you, know, you wouldn't ever see that big concentration. So the same thing happens you know, if, they're they, if they find themselves way out over the ocean and they're flying and flying and flying, and they really would prefer not to, or they're getting really tired and they see a boat, you know, they will land and... They always seem tired, you know, so... It's amazing to me that they can fly for four or five days, I mean, because they always seem tired when they do land. You know. Yeah, well, probably, you know, the tired ones yeah. are the ones that are going to go to your boat. I, right. I've, I've, been, I've, I've been out on boats like that and seen birds, you know, fly, and so I've seen them circle a boat and then just keep flying, or sometimes just see them just keep right on going, and they clearly aren't even thinking about going to the boat. And then other ones, like you say, they see that and they just get on as quick as, and they're probably, you know, the one that wouldn't have made it if they, right. the boat wasn't there. They, well, they don't usually make it anyways. I mean, they, usually a gull eats them. A gull will get them first, yeah. 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 I mean, migration is a dangerous business. There's no doubt about it. It's amazing that, you know, when you think of it, that they can, that they can do it at all. Um, and, and, and on average, you know, as a, as a general rule of thumb, we figure about half of them, you know, don't return every year. So, you know, it's between migration and whatever happens on the wintering grounds and this and that, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, tough, it's a tough business. So how important are little birds like that as a food source for other cr critters, you know? There's not much to them. I mean, when you pick up a little bird, there's not much to it. Right? Yeah, well, it's, I don't know, yeah, it's hard to know how that, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine that, you know, in general, that, it, that it's a huge food source for, say, gulls or or, or, or predatory fish, or, you know, or whatever, the ones that, you know, die in the ocean and so forth. But, I mean, I'm sure it, it does add something, but I, I, um, certainly for hawks that, um, you know, need to feed on birds themselves to get where they're going, you know, they're completely adapted merlins and sharpshin hawks. That's all they do is they, they, they 
migrate with the migration and eat the birds along the way. And you know, I, I remember seeing out on Monhegan, you know, a peregrine falcon that had caught some small bird and it was just flying like this, you know, and just eating it, just kind of sort of flying and eating its uh, food on the on the wing. And so they, um, you know, they really they they really rely on it. But I'm not really sure, I you know, how much food they are providing for other um, creatures. In, in Europe, some of you may have followed, you know, the fact that in many countries um, in northern Africa and in uh, parts of other parts of Europe that, you know, people catch millions of, of these migratory birds that are going down into southern Europe and Africa and, e and eat them. Um, and so there they have uh, another you know, just another hazard that we don't, for the most part, don't, they don't deal with in much of the Americas. There are places in South America and in the Caribbean where migrants are hunted, and, or shorebirds in particular, but, um, but there in Europe and Northern Africa, they have a tradition of you know, catching small birds and, and migratory hotspots with different techniques and, and, and selling them or, or eating them. So they're one of the biggest predators for migratory birds over, over there. Thank you. I was just wondering why they would be making so much noise at night when they're migrating. Are they communicating with each other or are they, what's going on there? Yeah, the, uh, the question about is, is about what, you know, why, why do they call at night? And um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Um, there's some theories about, about it, um, for example, you know, that um, well, well, most of these birds are not traveling in a flock like like Canada geese or something like that are. You know, you think of the geese, you know, traveling together and staying together. But most of these birds are just in, you know, they, they just take off and they're sort of loosely associated. They don't stay together or try to stay together uh, in, in the same way that a Canada goose flock does. But there may be some kind of cohesion that they try to keep when they're up there in the dark sky moving through, um, you know, knowing uh, that there are other birds around you, knowing it's kind of, you know, that you're headed in the right direction, that um, may be calling so that you don't run into each other is another part of it that, that may be um, a reason to call. They do call more when, um, when it's cloudy and they can't see. Um, you know, they're, they, you know, apparently are, are confused and we, we, you know, say scared, what, whatever that might mean for a bird. Um, so, it has something to do with, um, you know, with, with either communicating with other birds so you don't run into them. I've sometimes wondered if they use some of those calls, um, since they do it when they're, uh, when it's cloudy and things like that, if they use some of them almost like a sonar, because you can, you know, even if you're out sometime and you hear them call, um, you know, if you're over a parking lot, you, 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 even a human can tell that the sound qualities are quite different than if you heard them over a forest or over water. And I can't help but think a bird, you know, being so tuned into sound would really be able to detect that it's telling them something about what's around them. And maybe, you, you know, in foggy conditions when you're worried about, you know, as a pilot would be running into a mountain or a tree or something calling, you know, it might give you some sense of what's around you acoustically so that you could find uh, you know, if you're too low or too high, diff different kinds of things to give you a sense of, of um, the danger around you. But all of that stuff is conjecture, and um, I don't think anybody's figured out a way to, to test it. I don't know if it's testable or not, um, but um, those are some of the ideas, yeah. Is climate change, um, over here, is climate change a problem for migration? Well, certainly, I mean, uh, you know, because it's a weather dependent behavior and part of their life history strategy, the, you know, um, these birds that are migrating across the Gulf or, or across um, the Caribbean, you know, when, when uh, hurricanes hit, it, there's lots of anecdotal stories of, you know, thousands of dead warblers washing up on a beach in Texas, you know, or on the on the on the Gulf Coast that were caught up in a hurricane um, and, and died that way and so um, certainly you know they it, it's a it's another hazard that um, can affect them um, you know the just the general patterns like 
I was mentioning earlier about you know changes in the timing um, if they if there's becomes a mismatch between when they arrive and when some other thing happens you know related to uh, the peak of insect abundance which is related to the uh, when uh, the leaves start coming out and in um, and trees and shrubs it, it all ends up being linked together and if you know if they don't arrive at the right time they have lower reproductive success and so yeah there's lots of different ways that affects them during migration um, you know if there's sort of a pattern like we've been having in the springs now a lot where you know um, it used to be that we tended to have the low pressure systems stay to our a little bit to our north like over Labrador and and in Quebec um, in the spring and we tended to have warmer weather so more southerly winds in May in the last decade or so you've been seeing more situations in May where we get that um, that low pressure system that just hangs right over you know Maine in the Northeast so we might have a week of of that cloudy weather and that's when the birds you know they, they don't really like to migrate into that so they just stay to the south or if it lasts long enough sometimes they migrate anyway because they just want to get north and they sort of start filtering in and so they they get there later it's harder for them to get there and so forth so things like that certainly would affect it and so much of it is happening so quickly people don't really know you know and, and we also just are only starting to understand migration and get some of the tools that we need you know we talked about satellite uh, telemetry and some of the new um, little chips they're putting on birds some of these things are giving us our first look at how how birds are moving in a day-to-day -day, um, cycle, you know, and, and the small-scale movements and things like that. So we're, like the technology is just starting to catch up to us in such a way that we might be able to understand more about how some of those changes in, in weather during migration might affect um, some of the birds. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Jeff, very much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks again, folks, for coming out. A couple of dates that you may want to keep in mind. Um, on May the 17th, we'll be having an International Migratory Bird Day celebration in conjunction with Junior Ranger Day. So the, Inst the Scudic Institute and Acadia National Park will, will have those dual events. And, and um, it, these are events for people of all ages. So I think that includes, yeah, everybody. So please uh, mark that on your calendar and come out if you can. Um, on that particular day in the afternoon, we'll have Zach Cliver, who is a naturalist for the Bar Harbor Whale Watch Company, and he'll be talking about whales and seabirds of the Scudic Ridge. So we actually have geologically um, structures that go out here in, into uh, the, the Gulf of Maine, and it's a place where whales come and where whales are and where upwellings happen, seabirds gather. So um, one of the most, in addition to migration, that's, that's one of the other spectacles that's right here within a stone's throw of Acadia National Park. And um, Zach will talk about that, and I'll bet he could convince a few of you to get on one of those boats and go out there to see some whales this, this coming summer. And then um, in June, a former colleague of mine when I was working for Project Puffin, Seabird Sue Schubel will be here talking about the latest news about seabird breeding. That includes puffins and terns and murres. And um, she's a very entertaining speaker, so you'll want to come out for that. The way that you can tune into that without remembering it this very evening is to check out the Scudic Institute website, scudicinstitute.org. And or, if you're into social media, look at our Facebook page, and you can find us there. You can also connect to the Institute and to the park on the Acadia National Park website. And Abe would like to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing coming up. Our next talk is going to be on April 16th. Uh, Rick Bonney from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, is going to be talking about the um, next steps in citizen science. So. He's an ornithologist by training. He's also the guy that coined the term citizen science, which is uh, members of the public getting involved in, in the scientific process. And before that talk, we'll be having dinner on campus as well. And so you can 
arranged to have dinner before his talk, and uh, you need to make reservations, you can call the main desk for the Scrutic Institute, and the number is on the Scrutic Institute's website. And so that, um, that again, is April 16th. I think, uh, I think dinner will be at 6 o'clock, and then the talk will be at 7 um, that, that evening. Uh, but you can look at the Scrutic Institute website. And one last note before you're free to go is the, Jeff mentioned the, the passenger pigeon display in the vestibule or out in the foyer there. Um, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the death of Martha, the passenger pigeon that was the last remaining one of that kind uh, who died in the Cincinnati Zoo. And so, at least nationwide, to my knowledge, and it may be broader than that, there's a uh, project passenger pigeon that is doing a special um, educational scenario about the passenger pigeon. And um, so what you see out there is, is part of that uh, project passenger pigeon effort. And you can go to the project passenger pigeon website, download those posters like I did, and, um, and then displayed them. And I want to publicly thank a fellow named Bill Townsend, who in our region is, is a, um, a really incredible naturalist who's been keeping track of things for um, many, many decades. He alone has been consistently running our Christmas bird count here since 1957. Hasn't missed a year, to my knowledge. So uh, he is the one who loaned that particular uh, passenger pigeon mount. They're not easy to come by. So thank you again for coming out tonight. Thank you, Jeff, for making the trip from Wagner and enlightening us about the wonderful world of birds, the Boreal Songbird Initiative, and the Great Boreal Forest. Thank you, folks. Have a safe drive home.